Our next reader is the assistant director at the Waukesha Public Library. That's in Wisconsin. He also edits the Hugo Award-winning magazine, Electric Velocipede. In 2007, he edited an anthology of science fiction and fantasy stories based on spelling bee winning words called Logoria, Good Words Make Good Stories. He edited a reprint anthology of fairy tale retellings called Happily Ever After that came out from Nightshade Books in the summer of this year. And in 2013, a ALA Editions will publish his reader's advisory book on steampunk. <laughs> and I'm very happy to welcome John Klima because he's been my editor for many, many, many years. I, I've published a few stories in his uh, in Electric Philosophy, and I'm glad to be able to turn the tables on him tonight. Please welcome John Klima. <laughs> that happens at times. So this is something I actually wrote. It was a little different from me. Uh, and keep in mind, this came to me in a dream. One. I step into the cafe. My glance settles upon a display case of fabulously unhealthy cookies and treats sitting beneath a neon sign that reads coffee inside, like it's imperative telling the coffee where to go. <laughs> Jason Smith, small press publisher, chats with his girl at the moment, Adriana. I am late. Adriana will not be joining us for coffee. She's getting a new tattoo and has already stayed longer than she wanted. Jay, as I am prone to call him, wants to speak to me about a story I've submitted to him. My family sits further back in the cafe. Brother, sister, mother, father, all crammed around one tiny cafe table. My father keeps jostling my mother's cup, sending coffee splatters onto her new taffeta coat while he listlessly stirs his cappuccino. I can tell from his face, it's not what he expected. Jay must not have good news for me. We're not getting a table. Jay wants to talk in the doorway of the cafe. I wish we would sit down. If we did, I could order a cookie. And then he would have to discuss the story with me, not just give me an answer and jet. Of course, that's the point. The table nearest us is populated with almost a half dozen Victoria's Secret models. They are dressed in their catalog lingerie, <laughs> eating cigarettes and smoking biscotti. Now, I could be wrong, but I thought smoking had been banned in restaurants. They get up one by one and plant a kiss on a smirking Jay's cheek and return to the table, doing their catwalk strut both ways. Although the cappuccino is not what he expected, my father is unexpectedly pleased with this new show of thrusting hips and stroking lips. My mother dabs meekly at the darkening stains in her taffeta. The thing is, I'm trying to listen to what Jay has to say. Even without a table, there certainly are a lot of words coming out of his mouth. But there's this toffee cookie that's shaped into a butterfly that has an unhealthy hold on my attention. The cookies are $10 a piece, but I know they're worth it. Jay makes some affirmative noises and chucks me on the shoulder. He walks out, leaving me to wonder what his decision was. Laughter erupts from the model's table, and my mother stalks out in disgust because my father has spilled her coffee again. Two, I step into the cafe. My eyes drawn to the empty display case sitting beneath a dead neon sign that reads coffee inside like it's an imperative telling the coffee where to go. I'm sure there are treats to be had at this cafe. They must be restocking exactly at the same moment I'm hungry. Jason Smith, independent publisher, is discussing cover stock with his business partner, Alessandra. Smith, as he likes to be called, has an office around the corner from the cafe. He often holds informal business meetings here since it's larger, and therefore more comfortable, than his office. Alessandra has an ax to grind about the new prices their paper supplier is quoting them. She has paper samples from all over the country, each marked with a price, each price cheaper than what they currently pay. Alessandra leaves, bolstered by Smith's confidence in her, and angered by the injustice done to their customer loyalty. Her igloo eyes freeze people out of the way as she disappears around the corner. Her voice sure to stream razor, blade, <coughs> razor blades at the delicate throat of an unsuspecting paper supply customer service worker once she arrives at the office. <laughs> Smith wants to talk about my novel proposal. My odd story, after many edits, put a small press on the map and allowed him to burgeon into a highly touted independent publishing house. I've expanded the story's concept into a novel, although at this moment it seems unreal to me that I wrote either. My family sits back, further back in the cafe. Brother, sister, mother, and father all clustered around a tiny table, picking up cookie crumbs one at a time with their index fingers. My father is fastest and gets the most crumbs. His gloating smile irks my sister, which then flusters her to the point where she cannot get any crumbs. Smith, 
as his closest friends call him, doesn't want to sit. He thinks better on his feet. He's telling me something. Certainly it has to do with how my novel will fail or succeed. That it's some sort of literary egg that will hatch numerous writers who expand and improve on my theme, as well as those who do nothing more than just copy me and gorge themselves from my success. Or perhaps it's like the eggs that sat on the sunny counter for too long and now you're afraid to touch it, because doing so will get its indefinable stink on you, and that's a stink you can never get rid of. <laughs> the table nearest us is populated with a has almost a half dozen Victoria's Secret models, <laughs> dressed in filthy potato sacks and eating a raw chicken. <laughs> they get up one at a time and head towards the bathroom looking nervous and nauseous. They always appear satiated and relieved when they return. I learned from a nearby conversation that the former cafe owner and maker of the toffee butterfly cookies died recently with the secret of their creation locked in his bitter heart. His, res his resentful widow has eaten all the remaining toffee butterfly cookies, thereby also leaving the rest of the world with nothing from the cafe owner. The cookies are, once again, all I can think of, while Smith chatters in my ear. The fact that I never got to try one is a heavy burden. I tilt towards Smith and nod my head vigorously so he feels like I'm listening but I'm really somewhere else. My sister storms into the cafe's kitchen to demand more cookie crumbs because my father has eaten them all, but there was no one there to help her. Every baker who comes in to replace the dead butterfly cookie maker has been chased away violently by desperate loyal customers longing for their lost treat. The cafe placed a small handwritten sign on the counter noting that it regrets no longer being able to sell baked goods and that people are now welcome to bring their own. <laughs> Three, I step into the cafe. My eye is drawn to the display case of intergalactic cookies and treats sitting beneath the holographic pseudo-neon sign that reads, Coffee Inside, in English, as well as more than a dozen non-human languages like it was an imperative, telling the coffee where to go, no matter its planet of origin. Jason Smith, publishing Tycoon, is yelling at Giselle, his current assistant. She has forgotten to polish the rooks in Mr. Smith's ivory chest set. There's a rumor that the pieces are not made of ivory, but rather from the femurs of previous, previous assistants. <laughs> Mr. Smith, as he demands to be addressed, was so angry with Giselle that he followed her as she went on her daily duty to get his coffee so he didn't have to stop berating her. I followed them into the cafe as I've been waiting for an hour for Mr. Smith to stop yelling. I'm, sure, I'm unsure how long it will be before Mr. Smith notices me. Giselle is fired, and Mr. Smith takes her only pen to use as a swizzle stick to blend absinthe into his coffee. He confides to Dolman in particular that it's the only way he makes it through his day. When Giselle arrives at unemployment, they tell her she is ineligible for benefits because she has no pen to fill out the paperwork. <laughs> they take down her information to ensure that she will receive no benefits even if she comes back with a pen and wearing a disguise. Mr. Smith motions, to, motions me to him, and I tremble like a leech. My family sits further back in the cafe. Brother, sister, mother, and father are clustered around a tiny table reading pamphlets about other worlds to visit. They all look much older than I think they should. My father doesn't appeal well at all, but it's because he wants to go to Pennsylvania and everyone else wants to go to the moon. Mr. Smith wants to talk to me about my publishing imprint. It's apparently doing quite well, but he might have to let me go. Or maybe he's giving me his job since I would be better at it. His voice is loud and cleaves through my Saturn coffee throbbing brain like a Viking's axe. I have nothing but this conversation to focus on, but Mr. Smith is so loud I couldn't hope to hear him anyway. The table nearest us is populated with almost a half dozen Victoria's Secret models. They are naked, perhaps, and definitely not earth born. They're eating newspapers, actual paper newspapers, that must cost $250,000 a piece. They are all nearly seven feet tall and literally rail thin. No human has been able to wear Victoria's Secret lingerie for 10 years now. <laughs> they get up one by one and lick the side of my face before they return to their table. Most men I know would give their left ventricle to be licked by a model, but it just makes me feel sticky. There's a talk from, Miss, there's talk from Mr. Smith of a need for aliens to be on the publishing house staff since the Earth's population is now more than three quarters non-human. I can't remember if I saw this fact on a piece of newspaper sliding into the gullet of the Victoria's Secret model, or if Mr. Smith shouted it at me. It could refer to the cafe or to my imprint. My imprint is read by 95% of humanity and 0% of the alien population. But in the end, aliens are where it's at. It's clear there's no longer need for my imprint, and as a result, I'm out of a job. 
but that could just be a bad dream I'm going to have. <laughs> it is at this moment in Mr. Smith's conversation to me that I note the toffee butterfly cookies are back. <laughs> at least something that looks like a toffee cookie and is also like a butterfly. Its delicate wings flap languorously underneath the glass. I suspect it might be an alien artifact of some sort, or perhaps even an alien creature. The cafe became acclimated to alien clientele quicker than any other nearby businesses. I feel in my pocket to see if I have enough change for the $1,850 treat. I'm not going to miss out this time. <laughs> my father rushes towards the door of the cafe in his wheelchair, angry that he cannot travel to Pennsylvania and refusing to go to the moon, no matter how good the hunting and fishing might be there. At last, I find a stray $2,000 bushy coin in my pocket and walk to the counter, leaving Mr. Smith in my wake. These might not quite be the toffee cookies I wanted so many decades ago, but I don't have the decades left to wait for them to come back should they disappear again. Mr. Smith walks out, pushing people out of his way and knocking my father out of his wheelchair. He's confident I got whatever message he had to go. It's always been that way, and I've yet to understand him. Not that it matters. I finally have my cookie cradled in my hands. The lingerie models motion me to their table. We laugh a lot. I eat my cookie, and it is wonderful. <laughs> for sale at the table, as, as a few of the readers do tonight. Um, one of the items is this little chapbook with an, an interview uh, with John and one, and one of his stories it's called what Life's... Tonight. What's that? What I read tonight. Yes. It's called Life's Simple Pleasures. And I have to point out this interesting fact that these are all hand-bound and the coffee stains on the front are genuine coffee stains. <laughs> Every one you get will be unique and there's only a hundred copies, so, so get one from John. And uh, he's also got copies of the magazine he edits, Electric Velocipede. Um, this is the last print issue. Electric Velocipede is going to be only online um, from now on. I have a story in this one. I'm not saying that this is the one you should get. <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. 